some reverb there. How are we all doing on this fine evening? Uh, I think we solved the problems we had last week. For those of you that wasn't here, we had some odd streaming problems. It was mainly down to our internet here. One of the joys of trying to stream using normal household broadband, I guess. But hey, I seem to have fixed it, or at least PlusNet seemed to have fixed it, and we're here. So I hope everyone can can hear and see, and everything's working. In fact, I've upped the uh, the streaming from 720p to 1080p, so possibly. I even look a bit clearer than I have done in the past. You may also notice that it is just me. My esteemed colleague um, and better half is not with us today. She's actually feeling a bit unwell and she wasn't really up for it. So I said, I'll still do pouch. I'll do it by myself. You have just me. I hope that's all right for everyone. I hope that doesn't bother anyone because we've got plenty of really interesting and, and quite fun stuff to go through. Um, let's do a quick roundup of what we're going to talk about today. So we've got some animal news and this is um, in the realms of a rat related Guinness World Record. We've got a little piece about um, something that happened last night which was that I got to see David Attenborough which was uh, very much a big life achievement. We have, you can see that my, my esteemed and better half is on the chat and is um, probably going to be happy to answer any questions while I'm chatting away. We have a, um, a piece, I've been working on and off of this for, for quite a while now. It's something that I'm really quite fond of and that is theory of mind. Do rats have theory of mind? Um, we've got a little bit that I've done, a bit of research I've done, um, some questions and things around that. Um, we've got some bits around Christmas um, and uh, a couple of updates on Selly that I think people might be, might be a little bit interesting. Um, excellent. I'm I'm freezing a bit, am I? That's joy to know. Yeah, I'm freezing a bit. I can see on the stream. I can always drop back down to 720p if it still does it. We can go on. So, um, animal news. So we had some rather exciting news that we saw. I was struggling to find any news that I would consider news news, as is always the case. There's always limited amounts of rat news in the in the tabloids. So this come from a bit close to the home, but this was um, a rat which had um, been given a world record for the most high fives in 30 seconds. Quite an unusual, um, an unusual world record, but when you look through the Guinness Book of World, I had a little look to see what else Guinness Book record wise there is. Um, and a lot of them are they're very negative when you look towards rats. They're things like the largest rat king ever discovered or the most rats ever removed from a household. So to see something positive about rats is actually quite a nice thing. And um, so, so I've actually got um, a little poster. Let me get onto my browser for everyone. There we go. There he is, that's Frankie. He's the um, official Guinness World Record holder. And possibly, from what I could see, the first individual rat to hold a world record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie did? Oh, yes I do. Well, who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video okay, of what Frankie, Frankie. did? Oh, uh, yes I do. Well, who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie did? Oh, yes I do. Who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie did? Oh, yes I do. Who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie? Frankie did? Oh, uh, yes, I do. Well, who wants to see the video of Frankie, Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie did? Oh, uh, yes, I do. Well, who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. Now you might be wondering, do I have a video of what Frankie did? Oh, yes, I do. Well, who wants to see the video of Frankie doing what he does best? Let's see. World record. There we go. What do we think of that? I have a feeling that might have been playing double audio over that, which might have been a bit odd. Um, Apologise if, if I left the audio from my preview stream on, which is probably doing a double audio. Um, but yeah, so th this was Frankie doing his, um, his old high-fiving. And there's actually a, another piece to this, and that is that Frankie was actually bred by none other than our, my dearest esteemed colleague and wife, Claire. He comes from here. 
Um, his wonderful owner, um, Jess and her family, um, really, and these are first time owners as far as I'm aware, first time owners of, of Fancy Rats, who then went into training all of their rats to perform various tricks and this was one of them they taught. So absolutely amazing to have one of ours go off and do this and he's, he's a scrumptious boy if I do say so myself. Um, absolutely breathtaking to see and um, I'm sure it will be down onto the uh, on the website soon on the Guinness World Record website. It's, it's, apparently, it's been processed. Um, I'm sure we'll be sharing plenty when it does when it does pop up on there. But yeah, what a wonderful piece of news! Uh, let's move on. So, I got to do something rather special yesterday. Something that you wouldn't normally get the opportunity to do unless you just happen to be in the right time at the right place. And I just happened to be in the right time or the right place, or, or rather, I just happened to be working for the right person at the right time. Um, so for those of you who don't know what I do for a day job or who I actually work for, so I work for an organisation called the Landscape Institute, and um, we are the chartered body for landscape architects in the UK. So these are the guys that would go out and they would design um, public spaces. They would design your parks. Um, they would design your inner city gardens. A lot of the places that you would see if you're inside um, like a town or it, it's very, very wide reaching and it's, <clears throat> it's very, very, <clears throat> very, very special work that they do. Um, and it ties over a lot with um, biodiversity and animals in a lot of ways. And for this reason, we, or I'd say it, the guys who run the Institute, decided to, um, to award uh, Sir David Attenborough with um, an LI medal for a lifetime achievement for people, places in nature. And this is something that there's not been that many given out of the years, and he graciously accepted, um, and we tied it into giving him this when we had our annual awards that we have once a year. So, um, of course, I volunteered to go, something I don't normally do. I'm not normally great at these sort of public events, but hey, I decided to go just because I wanted to see the man my own eyes. And in person, he is just as amazing as he is on TV. He stood up and did an amazing presentation, an amazing speech, um, just explaining like the difference between when animals were collected in the past um, and then collected now. So he was saying back when he first started, um, the idea of, of preserving animals or collecting animals was that you go out into these these ecosystems, you find the rarest animal that you can find, one that's um, there's only a, a couple left in the wild, and you take it and you put it in a zoo, and then you invite all these people to come along and see it, and you can tell them, hey, you you know you're, you're seeing this animal that no one else can see because we've got one of the last ones here. And how things have changed over time and how now we sort of understand that you can't just save one animal, you have to save an entire ecosystem. And he was talking about how the work needs to be done to protect ecosystems um, in order to protect all the animals and make sure that they all survive and not just one that we maybe we find particularly pretty. Um, and that goes for the plants, insects and all sorts. So I think that's rather fitting for some of the things that we we see and we're experiencing day to day now um, with uh, climate change and all sorts that we're going through. It, it was a really awe-inspiring speech that he did. And um, yeah, I, I really, really, really enjoyed enjoyed watching um, watching there. I've actually, I have got a picture which I meant to put up. Let's see, uh, 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 there we go. So this was from last night. Sort of smiling slightly like, why did I agree to go here? <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, it was it was amazing. Just to just to be in the same presence of the man was um was absolutely amazing. I, I was certainly something I can I can die happy now. Um, I guess we can move on to the main event, the main thing I've been preparing for to talk about, and that is, do rats have theory of mind? So, for those of you that maybe you've never heard of theory of mind or don't quite get what it's it's meant to mean it's the the study or the 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 way that animals or potentially humans as well humans and animals um have a uh, a social or cognitive skill that um, allows them uh, it's involved in the ability to think about mental states beyond oneself i.e you're thinking about how others think um and that others are not you or they don't think like you or they don't possess the same knowledge as you and that's something we as humans, we take that for granted. We think, well, I, I know I don't know everything. You know, I talk to other people, they tell me something, but 
for animals to understand that is quite unique. Um, and it's something that a human child will only learn to do at the age of four. So we're not born with this. It's something that develops in us. Um, it just seems like a very obvious thing to us humans. Um, but can, um, can we uh, at least apply this to non-humans? Um, can we attribute mental states to others? Um, it still remains up, up for debate whether that's something that is true, but there is a lot of research into this. Um, and what I was what I was seeing a lot of is that there's a, there's a lot of two sides to this. You've got people saying, well, this, this research goes towards theory of mind that they're conducting on various different types of animals, or whether it's something to do with um, behavioral reading. So they were saying, essentially, it's, it's very, very difficult to distinguish in animals the difference between being a mind reader and a behavioral reader. So I guess you would take this as a, if you talked about, say, dogs, for example, um, if you were, hello again, I lost myself. That's good. Always good to lose yourself. That, that's fantastic. I assume I'm not still breaking up as much as I was, or possibly still am. You need to find yourself again then. <laughs> um, where was I? Is it still, is the stream still breaking up? Is it still going a bit weird? Anyone confirm they can still see me okay? Because my YouTube window just went a bit weird. No, yes, no, 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 no. I think I still keep breaking up. Give me a minute, I might, I might swap over to a lower bit rate again. Oh, you're all, we're all good. We're all good. Okay. The downside of always trying to run this. Never mind. Right. Anyway, so current research into it struggles to distinguish between mind readers and behavioral readers. So my example for this um, would be in dogs. Uh, they're very, very good at picking up on the way you act and the way you present yourself. And for that reason, they might act on that. That doesn't mean they understand that you think differently to them. So that's, I think, where some of this research falls foul. But it's still interesting nonetheless. So... I have um, no now totally frozen here. Yeah, it does seem to be. Maybe I'll quickly flip to a different bit rate and see if that addresses it. Because I'm getting a lot of drop frames on here. This can be. A, give me two seconds while I quickly change it and click restream again. Do that work? Just I'm waiting to see if it. Current resolution isn't optimal. Let's see. So maybe that's better. Maybe that's come better. Um, I'm hoping that seems better. Yeah, that, that, you know, that looks better for my end. Cool, right. Sometimes you push too much through the pipe, which is the internet, and it just complains and goes a bit weird. So um, do let me know if that seems to be better. Better, good, good, good. Right, let's carry on. This is a study that was conducted by the University of Chicago, and this was looking into specifically this, which is theory of mind in rats. Um, and this experiment conduct is of this. So you've got rat A and rat B. And rat A is placed in a transparent plexiglass container. So, you know, yay big, not too large, just enough that they can see out, but they can't really move around so much. While rat B is placed in another plexiglass box. And this one's much larger, more like cage size. And the rat A's container is now inside it. So you can imagine this one container with the rat inside and a smaller container within with rat A inside. Um, and this is, this is obviously an actual experiment, I'm not just speculating. And so rat A becomes quite agitated. Um, they use female rats for this, this particular experiment um, because she's not able to escape her container and she wants to naturally avoid open spaces. She wants to get into the very, very corner of the larger container because that's naturally what she's gonna set herself out to do, but she can't. She can see that there's out because it's plexiglass and she can see through it. Rat B also wants to avoid open spaces and will aim to go into the very corner of this box. However, she can see the rat A is agitated. She sniffs at the door of the container and nudges it with her nose and eventually she pushes the door open. The rats then interact with each other before both going to the edge together. Now, you could say in this test that rat B helped rat A, that she understood that rat B was not herself. Um, rat a was not herself and that she almost experienced a type of empathy um wanting to kind of help i'm still seeing the stream card it's bleeding youtube youtube have changed a few things recently on their streams and ever since they've changed this it's been an absolute nightmare 
I know it's not just me, various other, other channels that I follow have been complaining the same thing. So, so much for me saying Facebook was the one that was letting us down because sometimes it's this. Um, so when similar tests were done with rat A, rat B, they offered rat B to the choice between choosing a treat or the option to free rat A from the container. And in most cases, rat B chose to save rat A from the container and forego the treat, which is rather, you know, rather special when you think about it. That's why I'm going to give up on having a treat. Instead, I'm going to help this other rat. And there were studies done between cage mates and strangers. So where's rat, um, rat A in the container varies uh, between being a cage mate of rat B or a stranger. And although if they were strangers, rat B was more likely to choose the treat than to free the rat. It wasn't always the case. Um, and in most cases, if they were cage mates, rat B would save rat A from the container first. So, that, I mean, that's why itself it doesn't prove theory of mind. It shows that rats have some cognitive tools to allow them to make... No, rat B wasn't male. <laughs> Both rats were female. You, it, it would skew the results if one of them was sex mad and just wanted the, the dough for themselves. Um, it, it, exactly that. It's a very, very simple form of society. And it, and it shows the ability to feel what another animal is feeling other than yourself. Um, so critics of the study, um, they, they put it down to something called emotional contagions, which is, and this seems to be something that's actually more common in rodents than most others. And that is where one individual feels something and that same feeling spreads across multiples in a group. Not necessarily because they're feeling empathetic or they want to share that feeling, um, but because they're responding to that same um, stimuli and then experiencing the same thing from their own experience. Now, when I saw that, I thought to myself, well, is that not how we operate? You know, we, when we see something sad on the television and it, it makes us upset, it's not because we're upset it's because we're we're feeling upset because we know how they feel and that makes us remember what it's like to be upset and makes us upset it's um it's it's really you know quite interesting for an animal to want to do that um the example they used is that how you see in meerkats in the wild and how if one sees a um a predator they start to get agitated they start to make noises and that's developed into like what we would call an alarm call or something to notify all the others in the group that there's a danger and obviously um, that they, they put that down as a, an emotional contagion so it's it's interesting it doesn't necessarily prove it but I think it really puts a big tick in the box to say these we I mean we know this as rat owners we know that these guys feel things but scientists need to prove it to themselves and they need to do this research we, we're biased um, and it's an interesting study. So I was looking at, you know, if, if we wanted to try and test this in our own animals, and this goes beyond just pouches, but how would, how, what is a very, very simple way of testing or how they would test um, for theory of mind? And there's, there's a couple of methods, there's four methods, some of which are, you could never, one of them involved goggles or an advisor. Uh, and I thought, can you imagine trying to put a visor on a pouchy? Um, just wouldn't work. They've done that on chimps, but I don't think doing that on rats would be particularly uh, particularly wise. But this one, I, I think you probably could do at home. And this goes for everyone watching. If you want to try this on your own animals, you could. It's called the Noah Gesser paradigm. Par paradigm? Par paradigm? Paradigm. I did write down the way to pronounce that. Um, so the idea is that you, ha you need four boxes and you need two humans. And one of the humans is designated the guesser, and another human is designated the knower. And the guesser will leave the room. So if this was uh, Claire and I with our pouches, and Claire was the guesser and I was the knower, Claire would leave the room and we would have four boxes. I would show the rats that I had a treat in my hand. I'd let them sniff it. I wouldn't let them have it, but I'd say, look, I have a treat and I'm going to put it in a box. And then I will cover and make sure they can't see what box I put it in but I'm gonna put it in a box and I'm gonna you know, cover the lid up or put paper in it or whatever. And at that point, Claire will come back in the room. Now she's got no idea either what box the treat's gonna be in. And 
she will point at a random box, whereas I will point at the box I know I've put the treat in. Now, the idea with this study is it's meant to prove, you know, that the animal understands that you, as a person, put the treat there, thus you know where it is. And this other person wasn't there, didn't hide the treat, and doesn't know where it is. Um, and then they get to go to one box, and one box only, and look for this treat. If they get the treat, they get to keep the treat. If they choose the wrong box, all the boxes get taken away, and that's the end of the experiment. And it's quite an easy way of testing this. I, I personally have a couple of issues with this in rats. I don't know how accurate this would be. I think you'd almost need to train them to understand what you were doing, and that would skew the results in itself. So I, I can imagine in rats that smell would play a part in this. You know, they, they would be able to smell what box it is. Maybe that would skew the results. Maybe they would go to a different box on that basis. Um, it also talks about indicating or pointing. That's That's the box that it's in that's the box there animals don't understand pointing it's something that we developed due to our well i mean there's various potential reasons why we use pointing whether it's arrow heads or um, just because we have fingers that we can do that with um, but animals have no understanding of pointing thus i'm not really entirely sure how you would indicate to a pouch for example that you want them to go in that box i mean maybe by banging on the lid something along them lines, potentially you're just getting their attention to come over to you. It would be interesting to try. I know some of the guys watching have got pouches. Um, I'd be really interested if you wanted to try this and see see what you guys, I mean, by all means, film it and see, see what they do. Um, I'm potentially going to give it a go myself and, and sort of see. Um, the other issue I had was um, eyesight. So it was talking about making sure that they, they can see what box you put the treat in. But as we know, their eyesight is not great. For that reason, I'm not entirely sure they'd be able to see what box you put it in, or even necessarily who put it in the box. We we don't know. I, I think this would be an interesting one to try, and, and quite an easy one to try as well. Um, so as a final sort of part on this, um, I, I was trying to rack my brains under circumstances, rather than looking for experiments or particular times. I was trying to look for a scenario that I've experienced that, in my opinion, delves into this realm of theory of mind. And the closest I can come to, so um, obviously we, we have Tetra. Tetra is, um, you know, a young male. He's, he's not skittish, but he's not a fan of being held. He's not a fan of being picked up. Um, he's quite happy to be around you. But if you try and pick him up, he'll squirm. You know, some rats don't like that. That's fine. We we understand that. We're fine with that. Um, he's, he's always had the opportunity to be held. He just chooses not to. Um, he does like being out. That's the thing. He does like to come out once a day, and he likes being around us. So there was one particular night. Um, I was not feeling great, and I was up in the middle of the night, which is not usual. And I come downstairs about 2 a.m., and Tetra noticed that I was I was about and come to the front of the bars and he's begging, please, please let me out. And I thought, you know, yeah, do you know what? You can come out, good boy. Open the, oh, I, you know, I don't necessarily always get him out the cage, just open the doors and he can get himself out. And he was very interactive. He came over and he was like, oh, this is, this is rather Marvel. This is not something that we normally do, but that's fine. And he was out for around an hour with me, just me. The others were all asleep. And he seemed to really, really enjoy it. But it's almost like he's never forgotten that. Because ever since then, and it, it did start then, he now purrs at me. So if I, if I put my face to him and I talk to him, he's, he'll purr at me. If he's on the back of the sofa and he, he comes behind me, he purrs in my ear. If I hold my hand up to him, he rubs his cheeks on my hands, he licks my hands. He's, he's, he's suddenly like, he's like, oh, you're my best friend. I love you so much. And, and what's odd is that he lets me pick him up. And he won't let Claire pick him up, but he lets me pick him up. And this is this is unusual for me. Um, I can put this down to, well, you know, it's not like there's a net benefit to him. It's not like he's like, oh, well, if I act this way, I'm going to get to come out at 2 a.m. every day because it hasn't happened before that point or since that point. It's almost like he remembers what happened. 
understands that I am not the same as Claire and that I was the one that came downstairs and I was the one that let him out and that he just loves me for it. I, I can't really put it any other way. It's really unusual, but fascinating and something that I've not seen any of the others do. So, you know, for me, that possibly comes closest to theory of mind. Him understanding that I am someone different than him and I made a conscious decision to do something for him and he's forever grateful for it. Um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, does this show that he had an ability to understand that I made a decision to get him out and that he was so happy and it made a lasting impression and that almost like he relives that moment and developed that bond because of that. It's, uh, it's I, I don't think it for once like proves theory of mind in pouches, but it, again, as I said before, I think it, it shows that the tools are there almost like it's like them building blocks before you evolve into that next stage where you do have that social structure really really interesting that's all i have on theory of mind i hope that was interesting um we've got a couple of little bits to finish up but i mean i've been working on the research and the reading through papers and stuff to understand how this works and observations for around a fortnight now so i hope it was it was useful information and by all means try it you know observe this in your own animals and see what you think we take it for granted this whole i know what you're thinking or i know that you think differently to me i mean i say that but i think sometimes politicians really struggle to understand that that people don't always think the way they do but hey ho um what else have we got we've got two things to finish up with today um it's oh the date today is the 29th of november which means we've got two more days before it's December. And at that point, I'm happy to say, yes, it's Christmas. Anyone says it's Christmas now? No, it's not Christmas, it's November. Christmas starts on the 1st December, as far as I'm concerned. And for that reason, we've been talking about doing a Christmas competition. We said we were gonna do one last year. We never quite got around to it. But this year, we've got one planned. And we're going to, um, we're not entirely sure what the prize level is going to be, whether we're going to do a first, second and third place for this, or just the first place. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see when we get close to it. But the idea we've got is that um, to enter this competition, starts on the 1st December, you literally just put your name in a hat, basically, on the Facebook group. Just say, yep, me, me, me. We will write all the names down on a piece of paper or on a little ticket, and we'll roll them up. And we will chuck them all into a box and Dear old Linda, um, Linda's Gimli, will go into the box um, probably around the 20th of December and pick out a random name. So we'll, we'll, it will be pouchy random. Can't guarantee it will be 100% random. It will be pouchy random. That's about as close as we can get. Um, and they will probably win maybe £30 worth of Amazon vouchers along them lines. Um, just to say to everyone, hope that you have a nice Christmas, etc. Um, so yeah, when you see that pop up on the group, um, be sure to put your name in the hat. It, I think it'd be well worth a uh, well worth entering just just to see. You never know; it might just give you that little bit to uh, buy yourself something nice over Christmas. Um, the final thing we'll end on is how many times have we brought this up on Unpouched? Selly. Selly is the little pouch rat. That was, the, that was not fed by her mum, who we hand reared from two days old. And you would think that that would mean that she would be the loveliest animal in the world, but no. She is by far, out of all the pouches we have, the most difficult. She is the one that bites, she is the one that screams, she is the one that chews carpets, she is the one that chews doors, she is the one that will scratch your legs, Everything that you, you don't want a pouch rat to be is what she is. I still love her to absolute pieces, but she drives me insane. I mean, I don't think I can even get them on camera, but I am just covered in bites and scratches. I've got a massive bite on my arm from the other day that has bruised up. Um, and it's, it's because she's being told no. She's being told that she can't do something and she doesn't like it. She'll be chewing a door because she wants to get in the bedroom. And I will say no, and I'll pick her up and take her downstairs. And on the way down, meh, 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 bite. She has no understanding that that is wrong. And I think part of it is because she's ham reared. She has no boundaries. Anyway, it has become an issue where I'm 
you know, I was getting bitten by her. And when I say bites, I'm not meaning bites that land you in hospital. I mean, we know that pouches can do a lot of damage to you. Um, this is not going to land me in hospital, but it's it's on the level. Anyone who's had a, a fancy rat bite where you go, oh, you little sod and you, you're pouring me blood. It, it, exactly the same as that. But it, every night it gets a bit much when you've got people at work asking, what's wrong with your hand? So at that point you start to question, is there something we can do? You know, is there something that's making her stressed? Something that we can do to improve her quality of life? She would be out the cage more and for longer. I mean, at the moment, she tends to be doing something bad and have to be put back within 15 minutes. And that means on average, she's only out for 15 minutes. And it's it's not fair on her, it's not fair on us. So we had a couple of ideas. Could it be something along the lines of polycystic ovaries that can drive hormone changes, that can possibly increase um, testosterone in female rats that can lead to this behavior? Is it just a response to her having been ham reared? Would maybe her being spayed make a difference? And it's a big risk. I mean, I'm, I, I don't tend to worry so much about having castrations done on males. It tends to be a fairly easy operation. But for females, it, it's a big old operation to be spayed. Uh, so I was a bit dubious initially, and I kept saying, let's see how it goes, let's see how it goes. But it's at the point now where I... I so we're going to go to the vets on Saturday, and we're going to just ask them, uh, you know, is this viable? Could this work? Is there anything we need to be aware of? And possibly book her in to, to see if having a spade will make a difference. It's, um, it, we're kind of out ideas. It, it's, it, we, we have, so, I mean, this has come up on the forum a couple of times. We've got a couple of, I think, our own babies that are now reaching that age where they're starting to become difficult. And they do, they all hit, oh, itchy back. They all hit around six months and they start becoming you know, uh, really difficult. And that, that is just the nature of pouches. You know, you've got the terrible six month period between six months and a year where they are nightmares. Once you've part this point, they can be lovely. Uh, but you, you know, it's getting past that. But generally when they start doing that, you put the rules in by picking them up when they nip you or do something they're not meant to do and put them back. You do that with Sally and she just cries nonstop in the cage. And not only do you then feel really bad, but she then has a brat fit, starts attacking her bed, ripping her bed, kicking her food everywhere, throwing everything around her cage. So it's not like that's even teaching her anything. It's not like she's learning from being put back, which is a real shame. So we need to do something, and this is all I guess we can think of. So, you know, fingers crossed, this, this makes a difference. Fingers crossed, um, it's something we can do. Uh, I think that's about us unpouched. We hit half an hour. I'm going to have a quick scan through the comments. Um, we've got the usual suspects. Always lovely to see people. It, you know, it means a lot that you guys are always here, always watching me or me and Claire babbling on about a load of crap every time. But it's it does mean a lot, and I'm really glad you're all here. Um, and be, we could pretty much make this about whatever you wanted it to be. If you had ideas, always share them because I'm always happy to start talking about things that if there's a particular subject because I've, I've, I've got the time to do the research because I, I have time put aside for doing this show so if there's a something you've seen like with the rat cars if there's something you'd like more research done and explaining I'm, I'm always happy to put that time in researching it and talking about it um, just let me know it's always interesting um, Remember a similar experiment where a rat appeared to be drowning and a rat often rescued? I have seen that one. It's a very, very similar experiment. I did see that one. I didn't know if people wanted to hear about rats almost drowning. I thought that being stuck in a box was um, was bad enough. But uh, um, I can't believe that YouTube has flagged... Uh, let me see. So, so Alan put, would a female want rat want food or sex? And YouTube held it for review. <laughs> Obviously, you say the word sex and YouTube goes mad. How, how bad is that? Um, probably the pouchy smell is very good too. I think they are. I think I think pouchy sense of smell probably gives fancy rats a run for the money. Um, they can learn that, see shadow the rat. I, I Exactly that. I, I've seen people train the rats to do similar things, so I'm not entirely sure how accurate it would be. Um, I, I, I think, you know, if you've got fancy rats or pouch rats give it a try you know you might find you might record something rather special you never really know 
Um, Arthur still actually picked up from his carrier last. Year. They don't forget. I mean, he he never forgot when he was ill. <laughs> <laughs> he still will occasionally bring us bags and say, "Can you bring us back?" Well, well, to Claire, not to me. I, I'm I'm merely a, a piece of furniture to him. Um, it sounds like carry out ferret. Ferrets have got a very unique mannerism. I, I really enjoyed when I had ferrets. I don't think I'd have them again, but I, I'm glad I had them and experienced the whole madness of having. I, I had four, four basically toddlers with teeth running around your house destroying things and when you've got one off of it, one out your bin um, there's someone else doing something upstairs um, <laughs> the, the madness it's something that's really interesting to experience is, is having ferrets uh, so Mr. Train for Mum's socialization and by necessarily mean to I think Matt that does play a part in it um, they, they, if they bite Mum Mum bites them back and she never had that as much as I would like to have kept her upbringing as natural as possible, I wasn't really down for biting her. So I don't think she ever learned that. But, you know, even at this age, I would, I mean, I might be completely wrong, but I would imagine that just being put back in the cage, they would learn very, very quickly that they've done something bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe, the, maybe that, that bird has flown the nest and that she's now at the age where she's not going to learn these things. It's... Um, it's it's odd. No, though they weren't really drowning. No, I think it was like um, it was like a like a ledge wasn't there, and they 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 could just about keep their head up, and there was a, a button or something. It was um, it was interesting. No sense you become for bad stuff, and they could say it could be a rest of a biting a rat. YouTubers had a lot of. I mean, I don't know if anyone keeps up with. I I spend a lot of time on YouTube, and there's a lot of rules coming in that are changing the way certain channels are, ma are managed, especially ones that in any way can be linked to content for children. So we're, we're not at any risk because A, we're so small, and B, none of our content in any way relates to or is meant for children. But there's a lot of channels. I mean, I, I, I want to get a little bit off subject before we finish, but I watch a lot of stuff related to Star Wars and because I'm a great big nerd. And... A lot of that would be, you know, as far as YouTube are concerned, aimed at children. So them channels are in a lot of a lot of concern, a lot of worry because YouTube will potentially be cutting the advertising um, that they make, and these obviously pay not only the creators' salary, pay them to make the videos they make for a job, but also staff that they sometimes employ. So it's a, it's a big change, and I, I think it's we might see a lot of changes in. In YouTube in the future, it's it's quite a so I, I yeah I'm, I'm not surprised how sensitive YouTube's become with things. It's a different world than it was, but well, I think that's it. Unless anyone else had any more questions, I think that's me unpouched. Just me. Maybe my esteemed colleague will be back again next week. Um, as I said, keep your eye out for the Christmas competition, which will probably go live on Sunday once we've got the intricacies or. Um, arranged but other than that thank you very much for joining me guys always appreciate you being here and um, sorry about the stream going a bit weird at the beginning uh, I will eventually work out how to make this work 100% of the time and I won't because there's I, I follow streams that have millions of viewers and they still have problems it's just YouTube um, so yeah bye for now everyone I'll, I'll finish us out on the intro